Well, good morning. I hope this morning has found you well. I want to welcome you to our to our little online sermon today. And I hope uh, last week we put our morning message on, and I hope that it was a blessing and an encouragement to you. My uh, daughter, Katie, gave me a little bit of a hard time about it. She said, wow, Dad, it looked just like you were really preaching to the people. And I uh, told her, I said, I can't just look straight into one little camera. It just doesn't feel right. So I still look around. In my mind's eye, I'm still preaching to Miss Sue over there to my left, to Mike and Linda over here to my right, and to my wife here, and to, to Katie sitting here, and Gilly sitting there, and all of the rest of the people that are usually out there. Miss Lynn right here kind of in front of me, and uh, I'm used to seeing you there, so I still am going to preach like you're there because you're in my heart and you're in my mind, even if you're not in this building with me right now. So I just want to say welcome to you. And I have some things I want to share with you this morning, if the Lord will help me. I want to read a scripture out of the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12, verse 25 through 28. Hebrews 12 and 25, it says this, Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your blessing and thank you for your goodness, Lord. God, help us to hear what you are saying to us. Lord, help us to hear what you're saying to our nation, what you're saying to your churches, or what you are saying to us, each one as individuals, Lord. God, help our ears, Lord, to be open and our eyes open that we might see and we might hear what you are doing in our lives and in our world at this moment, Lord. Stir us up, Lord God. Touch us this morning and open our minds and let us receive your message today, God. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, and everyone said amen. Well, I think we can all agree that this, this shutdown, I guess we could call it, it has afforded us some time to maybe do some things that we wouldn't normally be able to do. And I, 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 it's strange because I feel like I have had more time in the last week than I've had in probably, oh, I can't even remember when, but it just seems like I'm not getting anything done. I don't know if anybody else feels like that. I read the little funny meme this week, and it said, one person posted, after years of wanting to thoroughly clean my house but lacking the time, this week I discovered that that was not the reason. And I kind of feel like that. I have more time than I've had in who knows when, but it's, I've just seemed like I've had a hard time just getting going, uh, to getting a plan. I just feel sort of somewhat disoriented, I guess. And it's, it's kind of the same way with this message this morning. I have an assortment of sort of random thoughts that have come to me this week and hopefully the Lord and the Holy Spirit will somehow bring them together somewhat to make somewhat of a, a cohesive message this morning. But I'm just going to kind of kind of roll with it and let the Lord do with it what he will. But I, I think we can all agree that it's been sort of a strange couple of weeks. These last two weeks have been times like I haven't ever experienced and I don't think you've ever experienced before and uh, you know for the most of us life has just sort of sort of come to a shutdown sort of come to a standstill I mean it's just it's like nothing we've ever experienced it's like someone has sort of pushed the pause button on our life and on our nation and on our business and on everything we are normally used to doing it has just sort of come to a standstill so to speak life has just sort of been put on hold or life as we know it so to speak it's kind of like the Lord has just kind of said listen go to your room and think about what you have done Kind of like our parents when they say, you know what you've done, now I want you to go to your room and I want you to think about just what you have done and consider what you have done. I think the Lord has sort of put us all in like a time out. Now friends, when I was a kid, I, I would have much rather had a spanking than a time out. 
I'd have rather had a spanking than to be grounded. I mean, a spanking, it just lasted for, the sting just lasted for a little while. But, man, I didn't want to be constrained. I didn't want to be held down. I didn't want to be stopped from doing the things that I wanted to do. Now, friends, let me tell you, I have had the Lord scold me at times, many times. I've had the Lord give me a, a good old-fashioned spanking many times in my spiritual life, so to speak. But I tell you today, He has, he has sort of put us into a, a grounding, a moment of pause, a time to reflect, and maybe a time to sort of just stop and see what is truly important in this life. And I believe He's trying to remind us of some things. Now, again, these are in no particular order, but I want to share with you a few things that I feel like the Lord has been reminding me, and I, I have a feeling He's re been reminding all of us, and I think you'll resonate with a few of these as we go through. First of all, I believe He has shown us this week that we are not in control of our lives. We are not in control of our lives. You know, we as Americans, we, we sort of uh, feel good about the fact that we are self-made men and women that we're not afraid to get out there and work and make our own way and that that's a good thing in many ways to be like that to work hard and do right of course God approves of that but I think sometimes we feel like that in our own power that we can create these sort of all American dreams and all American ways of life in our own power. We can get our, our perfect little home with our perfect two cars out in the garage. We can have the manicured lawn and we have the 401k and we have our, our lives planned out and our vacations planned out and our retirements planned out and what our kids are going to go to school and what we're going to do and all of these things. And, and in our abilities, we feel like we've sort of got things under control and we have our lives planned out and we are free people. Thank the Lord for the freest nation on the, that the earth has ever known. But friends, at the end of the day, I want you to know I think this has showed us that we are not in control of our lives. We are not in control of our lives. And in a moment's time, our little utopia can turn into an episode of Road Warriors very quickly. It doesn't take long, amen. Number two, I believe it has showed us that we are all made from the same dirt. You know, very often, you know, we feel like we ascend to different stages in life. And I know we've all run into people that feel like maybe they are on a higher echelon than maybe us little people down here are on. But I think what this has shown us, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much power you may think you have. It doesn't matter how much fame and acclaim you may have, feel like you have attained in your life. At the end of the day, friends, every single one of us, from the White House to the Poor House, from California to New York, whether you're in Hollywood or Washington, D.C., wherever you're at, friends, we are all made out of the same dirt, the same flesh and blood. Each and every one of us are still susceptible to the same things in this life. Just this week, I've heard about actors and pro athletes and politicians and just today I read about someone from a royal family around the world that have gotten this coronavirus and some that have passed away. Friends, what it lets us know that none of us are untouchable. None of us are untouchable in this world today, amen. We may think that we have somehow set things in order and have our lives planned out, but I was reminded of another man in Scripture who kind of thought the same thing. It is in Luke chapter 12, verse 16. The Bible says there was, it spoke, that Jesus spoke to them in a parable, and he said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought to within himself, saying, What shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops, he said, This is what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns, and I'll build greater, and there I will store all of my crops and my goods. And I will say to myself, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, he said, Thou fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Friends, it doesn't matter who we are and how successful and how powerful we may think we are. Friends, at the end of the day, we are just flesh and blood. And we are susceptible to every trial and tribulation. This flesh and blood this, that, that any of us could face, we are all just as susceptible as the next person. Amen. Number three, we have learned... <clears throat> That our lives can change in an instant. Whether it be by this coronavirus. You know, one of the most amazing things that I have witnessed over the last few weeks is how quickly literally everything in life can change. 
I mean, everything has just changed seemingly overnight. Our, I mean, any segment of our society, it has been affected by this plague, this pandemic, this virus, just so fast. It is amazing that a, a country as, as large, as powerful, as prosperous as America, it is amazing that the world, as vast and huge as it is, with all the different kinds of people and government structures and all this, in that quick, in literally just a few weeks and months, Everything has changed in our world, amen. Just that fast, in an instant, everything can change. Now, friends, I want you to know this, has, this virus has brought that to light. But, friends, that was true already. That was true already. We've just been too busy to maybe notice. Or we've just been not paying close enough attention and not wanting to think about it. But, friends, in reality, there's not a moment of our life that goes by that if something happened, everything could change in an instant. We've seen it. We've all experienced it. Just in a moment, a tragedy could happen and change everything for you and me or us in our lives. You know, just this week, three things happened. Thankfully, the Lord was with me and I survived all of them, but it, it just reminded me again over and over just how quickly everything can change, everything in our life. I was driving down the road this week and I came up to a stop sign that in times past had been a, a four-way stop sign. So I pulled up, I stopped, I seen a truck coming from that away, but in my mind I was thinking he's going to stop too because he has a stop sign. So when I, when I stopped for a moment and then I took off, well then I looked up and noticed he was still coming full force at me. He wasn't slowing down at all. And then I looked up and realized it's not a four-way stop anymore, it's a red light and a green light. I had the red light, he had the green light. Luckily, he seen me. I gave him that look of, hey, I'm sorry, I'm ignorant, I didn't mean to do that. Wave at him, and he kind of looked at me like I was crazy, but luckily, he was paying attention. He swerved and missed me, and everything was okay. But it could have changed my life instantly in that moment, and his life too, just that fast. In another situation, I was trimming the hedges this week, and normally I wear safety glasses. I don't know what I was thinking, but I wasn't. And in a moment, as I was cutting those hedges, a big piece of wood shot up and hit me right in the eye, and it hit me so hard it felt like it kind of stunned me and almost knocked me out, and my eye still feels a little bruised. Thankfully, Lord, I, I'm okay. I can see, and everything seems to be fine except a little sore. But in that moment, just that quick, I mean, I was just having a good time going along there, and just that quick all of a sudden, Something hit me. I could have been blinded in one eye just in that instant. Uh, the same day, I was on the trailer, and I was shoveling uh, dirt off the trailer into the, into the wheelbarrow. And just in an instant, the trailer fell through, and I, my leg went plumb through the trailer and skinned me all up and bloodied me up. And just that quick, I'm shoveling, thinking everything's fine, and boom, the floor falls out from under me. I told Kim, I said, man, anybody, I hear these people say, man, I just enjoy doing yard work. I said, these are sick people. They are sick and twisted people. How could anybody enjoy this? This is beating. I mean, I'm beaten and bloodied. And my eyes hurt. My head hurts. My leg. It's just not right. Amen. But in just an instant, everything can change. Amen. James says it like this. James 4 and 13, he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go and do such and such in such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. He says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while, and then it vanishes away. See, friends, we've been reminded this week, these last few weeks, that just like that, everything in our life can be taken away and can be changed. We have been reminded in these last three weeks, or few weeks, of the things that are actually really important. Oh, we get so upset and so worried about so many things that really don't mean a hill of beans. But friends, these last few weeks, we have been reminded what is really important. I have been reminded over and over that I am so thankful that there is a God. There is a God. I talked to you last week a little bit about it, how he is always there with us, that we are in, not in this thing alone. But friends, I'm reminded over and over, I'm so thankful that there is a God, and I'm so thankful that I know him. His name is Jesus this morning. I look around at this world, I would hate to know that I'm facing this virus and facing this economic downturn and facing all the things, even things we don't even know what's coming our way. I would hate to think that I'm facing those things in my own power. I'd hate to think I'm facing those things all alone. 
I'm glad that I know there is a God and I know him this morning. He knows me, amen. And you can know him this morning too. I would hate to live in a world where I was depending on Washington to solve my problem. I would hate to know that I was depending on the ideas of so-called intellectuals that were going to solve our problem. I thank the Lord for scientists and all these things that do things that find cures for diseases and come up with ways that we can survive these things. But friends, I'm glad at the end of the day I know Jesus has got it. At the end of the day, he is my hope. He is the one that I am trusting in. I'm not trusting in some little $1,200 handout the government's going to give me. I'm trusting in my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I mean, I'm thankful this week that I've been reminded there is a God. I'm thankful that I've been reminded this week of how important other people in my life are. We have turned into such a materialistic type of, 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 of uh, culture. Friends, I told Kim the other day, I said, you know, when all this is over, if we get through all this, I'm looking forward to just hanging out with some friends. I was thinking about my friend Steve down in Victoria. I said, I, I'm looking forward to just going down, sitting out on the balcony with Steve and Janice, just chilling out, talking, having a few laughs, just, ha just, just being around people that I love and I enjoy, amen. It reminds us what's really imp important, our God our family, our friends, those good things that God has put us in our life. It has reminded us, friends, that life is so precious. Life is too precious to waste a single day, a single moment. The Bible says this, John 10 and 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And you may ask what that scripture has to do with what I just said about squandering the time that we have. Because friends, I want you to know every moment that you yield to the devil, every moment that you spend in sin, every moment that you spend doing the things the devil or this flesh would promote or, or drive you to do or tempt you to do is a moment that is wasted. It's a moment that is wasted. It is a moment that you are believing a lie. It is a moment that we are living a lie. It is a moment that is being stolen away from us by the enemy of our soul when our God says, I will give you life. I will give you the best life. I will give you things that will truly satisfy your desires of your heart. I will give you true, real life, not the lies of the enemy. See, friends, the devil says, do these things and it will bring you joy and it will bring you happiness. But if you spent much time in sin as I did much, some of my early life, you will remember it didn't bring you what it said it was going to bring you. You know, you see all these commercials on TV of people, you know, uh, out drinking and out partying and doing it. It looks so luxurious. But, friends, if you've ever been there on that morning after, you know it's not that luxurious. You know, you see all these muscle-bound guys smoking cigarettes or doing drugs or, or doing all these different things, and, and you think that looks fun, but they don't show the picture of the old man with the big beer belly hacking and coughing up half his lung and all these things. They don't show the broken family and all of these things. They just show you a lie because the devil is a liar this morning. He says that he has life for you, but he doesn't. He, has, he wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy anything good in your life. But Jesus said, I've come. You can be overcomers. You can live a life that God has planned for you that will bring not only momentary fun or happiness, but true, lasting, eternal joy and victory in this life. Amen. It has reminded us of the things that are really important. It, it, these last few weeks have also reminded us, friend, that we are all going to die. That's not a fun subject, but it's one that we have to talk about. Friends, at the end of the day, when things like this come up and we have to deal with our, with our mortality, it reminds us, friends, that none of us are going to get out of this thing alive. Not a single one of us. If the Lord tarries long enough and he doesn't come back, every person watching this, every person that in this world is going to die. And when we come up against something like this virus, it reminds us of just how fragile our lives are, just how close at any given moment any one of us are to leaving this life. We are all going to die one day. We all think we're going to live forever in this flesh, but we're not. We're not going to this morning, friends. The Bible says it like this. It said, and as it is appointed for men once to die, but after this the judgment, we have an appointed day. And whatever that is, friends, we, we live in a world full of tardiness, it seems like. It drives me crazy, people being late. But let me tell you something, friend. 
that is an appointment that every single one of us will keep. We will be on time for that appointment. And friends, if God chooses to take me by corona, if God chooses to take me by a car accident, if God chooses to take me by old age, or if God chooses to take me in the rapture of the saints, whichever one he chooses, there's going to become a moment in time when I'm going to leave this earth and be changed, and that I'm going to stand before God. And friends, I want to stand before him knowing that all of my sins are under the blood. I want to stand before him know him, knowing that not only do I know of him, but I know him. And when God, I stand before God in judgment, I'm just going to say, I, I, I get in because of what he done, not what I done. I'm glad this morning, friend, that I'm not going to be able to answer for all of my sins, but I'm going to be able to say, Jesus paid for my sins. My sins are under the blood. I've been saved. I've been born again. I've been washed. I've repented of my sins. I've placed them under the blood. I am saved this morning because, friends, I'm going to keep that appointment. And when I cross over to the other side, I want to know that I'm crossing over, stepping in to the arms of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, it has reminded us this week, or I hope it has reminded us, that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I heard a preacher say one time, he said, we are living in a day and age where every time we are behind the pulpit, we should, every opportunity we have, we should tell people, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And friends, listen to me this morning. Jesus is coming. I'm always reminded of the scriptures that are in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Friends, we are living in these days. We are living in the days of the scoffers. We are living in the days where people mock and make fun of the truths of God, where they make fun people who talk about the rapture and people who talk about tribulation and people who talk about heaven. They mock and they laugh at these, these truths of God this morning. So I, I don't know how many times in my life I have heard people say exactly these words. You know what? They've been saying that my whole life. People have been saying that Jesus is coming back since I was a little boy or a little girl. And you know what? The world just keeps on going on like it's always went on. That's right. And you know what? Noah, the preacher of righteousness, he told them that, that the flood was coming for years and years and years. And they laughed, they laughed at him. They made fun of him. They mocked him. But you know what? One day it started raining. One day it started raining. And see, friends, they may have been saying since you were born, Jesus is coming back. And you know what? You may live this life, and it may be another hundred years, but I'm still going to be saying Jesus is coming back. Because, friend, let me tell you, he hasn't came yet, but it don't mean he ain't coming. Am I saying that this coronavirus is, is meaning that Jesus is coming back soon? I don't know that one way or the other. But I tell you this, the thing I do know, there has never been a moment in history when everything is more lined up the, the way the Bible says it will be for Jesus to come back. We look around at the, at the technology. There's, you know, we, lots of times people have thought it was the end of time. But there's never really been a time in history when the technology and the things are present that truly there could be a one world government. That truly there could be a mark of the beast that every man, woman, boy, and girl would have to take to buy or sell. There has never been a time when the world is more hungry for one leader, a man, to stand up and take charge and fix all the problems. There has never been a time when people are more willing to literally yield to anybody or anything that will simply take care of them. I am constantly shocked at the way Americans 
are willing to just give away their rights or give away their freedoms or just surrender to the government at, for just a measly few dollars or few crumbs, they will give up their freedom if somebody will just give them something. Don't tell me that when the man of sin comes on this earth and he begins to have the answers, seemingly have all the answers to all these economic problems and all these wars and all this, they won't just yield like it's nothing. We see it right here. We see it right here today in just this little virus thing we're facing now, how people are just panicking and willing to do anything. And friends, let me tell you, we are living in those days when it is prime and it is right for the man of sin to arise in this world. We are living in a time of such spiritual ignorance when, when we have more Bibles and more access to biblical truth than probably ever in history. And yet people are so, I, I'm not being mean, but they're just ignorant of the truths of what God's Word says. It's right there. And we don't even take time to read it or see what it says about God and what His plan for this world is. Friends, Jesus is coming. And he may not come today, but he can. He may not come tomorrow, but he can. But I'll tell you this one thing, every moment and every second, he is one moment and he is one second, he is one minute closer to coming, friends. And let me tell you, Jesus is coming, amen. And you know, when we say these things, I don't care who you are, and you know, us preachers are maybe the world's worst at it. We, we, when we start talking about these end events, you know, and everything, we, we act like we're so, you know, we're so brave and we're, we're not worried about anything. I don't care who you are. When you start talking about the end of time, there's something in this flesh, it sounds a little scary. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't know how much we're going to have to go through. We don't know how much we're going to have to endure. The world is getting more and more evil. We, do, we don't know, you know, you know I, I've never been taken up in the rapture. I'm kind of scared of heights. I think I'll be all right when it actually happens. But, you know, I mean, there's things I don't know how that's going to happen exactly because it's never happened. I've never experienced that. But, friends, what I want you to know is we don't have to live in fear because, see, the Bible describes our end times the end times of Christian people, it describes it like this. It says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Friends, listen. The end times shouldn't be scary to us. It should, it should light up some anticipation with us. See, it says, it is the blessed hope. This is what we're looking for. This is, this is our victory. I've read the end of the book, and God's people win this morning. Amen? See, we, are, we should be looking forward to this. Now, I had a conversation with my daughters this week, and you know how they say if you live in a pastor's home, everything is open season when it comes to a sermon. You know, anything you can or say can be used in a sermon, okay? So, but we were talking just a little bit, and I, and I know what they're saying because I have felt these same things. I have thought these same things, and I bet you most of you have too. You know, when we think about the end time, of course we all want to go to heaven, but we want to live our lives here too. It's just natural. It's just something, it's, it's a humanity in us. You know, and I talk to my daughters and they say, well, of course I want to go to heaven, but man, I want to get married. And I want to, have, I want to have kids. And I want to experience life. And then when I get old someday, of course, then I want to go to heaven. And friend, I said, do you think it's any different for me? Do you think that I've gotten so old that I'm just like, well, life's over. Lord, come get me. I got nothing else to do. I said, in my flesh, I still think, hey, I still, I still want to experience things. I love to travel. I still got places I want to, me and Kim to go together. I want, I, I want to go back to all the places we've been again. I, I, want to, I want to try to build my hat business. I want to preach the gospel. I want to fellowship with my family and friends. I want to see my daughters get married. I want, to, I want to hold my grandchildren. I want to do all of those things too. It's just natural in this flesh to want those things. But as I told them, Friends, what we don't understand, everything that God has is better than what we have. Friends, you know, we think about, I always think about, you know, heaven wouldn't be heaven if I didn't, if Kim's not my wife and I didn't spend that time with her. But the Bible says we won't be getting married and giving in marriage. So it's, that sounds sort of depressing, but I told them, whatever relationship we have, it's going to be better than the relationship we have here. Because see, heaven is always multiplied. Heaven is always better. Friend, he's got things that's going to satisfy our needs and our wants and desires. I said, as long as we stay here, we may get those, some of those things that we're wanting, the marriages and the children and the memories and all that. But you know what? During all of it, we're going to face tragedies and troubles and trial and heartache. Times of laughter, yes, but there'll be times of, of torment and trial and tragedy and heartache and tears too. 
But friends, the Bible says when we go over there, he's got to wipe away all tears. We're finally going to be satisfied. All of those things that we want on this earth, as good as they may be at times, they're not going to satisfy. There'll always be something else we want, something else we want to experience. But when we step onto the other side, friend, we're going to finally know this is what I was chasing all that time. This is where I wanted to be all that time. This is what has truly satisfied me. When I'm in his presence and I'm there with Jesus, friends, we're not just going to sit around on clouds and play harp like little naked angel babies like I always like to joke about. No, we're going to live. We're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand thousand years here on this earth and then friends a new heaven and a new earth is coming down and we're going to live for eternity with God we're going to do things and experience things it's going to be better than this life could ever be it is our blessed hope it is what we are looking for this morning I want to close with these script, the scriptures that I read when we first began in Hebrews 12 and 25 it says this be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. Friends, in all these things that I've talked to you about this morning, God is speaking. God is speaking to the world. God is speaking to our nation. And friends, God is speaking to me, and he's speaking to you. He's speaking to us this morning. And he, he's saying, don't miss what I'm saying. Don't miss what I am saying. He says, be careful and do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. The one who is speaking this morning, friends, is God himself. God himself. You know, I've, I listened to a minister today, a great sermon, a great message. I just heard a portion of it. I'm going to listen to the rest of it this evening. And uh, probably going to share it on our website page, too. It's just such a good message. And uh, he, he's talking about in one little part of it. I didn't get to the rest of it, so I don't know exactly what all he said yet. But he's saying something that I've heard other ministers say, and I've, I've read some things on the Internet saying the same thing. But what, what the point is, if you go back and you look at the Egyptians back when they had the children of Israel held captive and God was wanting to bring them out and take them into the promised land, and the Egyptians were resisting and not letting them go. And we all know the story how there were God sent ten plagues against the Egyptians. And if you really study it out these weren't just random things that God threw out just to try to bring misery to them and you know the, that that wasn't just the purpose in those days they had lots of, of false gods and and what I, every one of these of these plagues so to speak was in a way God speaking and saying that's not God I'm God it was God sort of sort of as one man said he said putting his finger on that God and saying you're not God I'm God. It was God trying to speak to those people, letting them know the things you have placed your faith in, the things that you have placed your affections in, though they are misplaced, those things are not God. I am truly God. I am God. But they had, they had put these false gods in place of where the true God should be. And friend, he made a list, and I've made my own little list. I'm not sure exactly what his list is. I'm going to listen to it tonight. But God, in these last two weeks, he's done the same thing. He has taken all the things that we in this world, and especially here in America, I've noted, the things that we have ele elevated to deity almost in our life. Things that we wouldn't, we wouldn't admit it, <clears throat> but if you really look at it, we worship these things. We put these things on a pedestal, oftentimes above Christ himself, if we're not careful. And in, a, in a, literally just a couple of weeks, God has placed his finger on every one of them and said, you're not God. This is not God. This is not to be worshipped. This is not the thing that is, is, is to be glorified. And I thought of just a few of these things that God has taken away. I mean, we think about sports. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I love sports. Since I was a little boy, I've loved sports. I, I watch all the major sports, and I enjoy them when I can watch them. They're a, a, a good pastime. They've gotten to where I don't enjoy them like I used to just because the way people act a lot of times. But just the, the sport itself, I've always enjoyed sports, really have. But friends, we see a world and a nation that has elevated sports above just a, a fun little pastime, above just something to maybe momentarily, you know, take our minds off of life and a little bit of enjoyment, which is fine. You know, it's not a sin to go to a football game or something like that, but we see we have built great tabernacles to them, so to speak, in these great stadiums, and we have filled them with screaming fans. And we have, it is such a beautiful picture of what church could be. But oftentimes we miss church to go to these things. We have elevated our, our sports superstars. We pay them like, like they are kings or something. And friends, in just literally no time, all the sports are gone. 
It's just amazing. I mean, all the sports are gone. You know, you get out of church on Sunday and go home. I mean, there, there, there's no sports on there. Amen? But it's like God said, you want to elevate that above me? I'll show you that's not a God. We can go down the list. We can go to things like sexual immorality. And we live in a world where basically there are no rules. There are no, there are no guidelines. We, we, we have become a sexually immoral nation where literally anything goes. I mean, you, you, you pick your perversion, it's out there. And I'm not going to get into all of it, but you, you know what I'm talking about. We are surrounded by it. We, are, we have said that nothing is wrong, nothing is off limits, nothing. We, we don't check with God what's right or wrong anymore. We just do what we feel like doing. And God has said, well, I'll just, I can't get you apart, so uh, here's a little something for you. All of you just stay home by yourselves. All of you just stay home by yourselves. We, I, I was thinking today about things like our vanity. Oh, the vanity of, of mankind. I'm on Instagram a lot because I try to promote my business on there. But it is just mind-boggling to me how many selfies everybody takes and how, you know, they, how they got it so planned out so everything is so perfect and every hair is perfect and every muscle is rippling and every, everything is just so perfect and it's almost like every picture just saying, look at me, look at me, I'm all that, just look at me. The well, friends, you see some of them little funny jokes after a few weeks with no beauticians, after a few weeks with no manicures, after a few weeks with no gyms, after a few weeks sitting around on that couch eating Doritos all day. I have a feeling God say that vanity's nothing. You're just a flawed human being like all the rest of us. You're not all that. He has put his finger on our, our vanity. He has put his finger on our, our finances that we have put so much trust in. And he said, I can shut the whole economy down. He has put his finger on things like education. You know, we think, well, I, I, I feel like sometimes I just say just a bunch of educated fools. We have more, we have more so-called colleges and teaching going on and so much, not a lick of wisdom hot times than any of it. He said, I'll take all the things that you think is so wise and I'll show you just how foolish and just how useless it really is. All them big fancy schools perpetrating all their liberal lies and all their insanity and all their falsehood, they're all closed. Every single one of them. He has taken our, our entertainment, our concerts, and our actors, and our Hollywood, and all that, and he has said, you're not God. You may have thought you were all that, but you're not. He has taken even our, literally, our jobs. You might say, well, I don't worship my job. But how many times do we put our jobs ahead of what God would want us to do? How many times in the name of making a living do we put it before God or put it before our Bible study or put it before our prayer time or put it before even going to church? Well, you know, i got to make a living, so i got to stay home. Instead of trusting the God that said, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. God says, I'll put my finger on your job. We think about all the things we do to try to find pleasure, whether it's our vacation, and this and that and y'all know I love me some vacations now y'all know that I love to travel that is my oh that's just I, I'm 55 years old and still when I think about getting to go somewhere I get those little butterflies I kind of nervous feel I'm excited I just love to go I love to travel I love to see new places I just love to be out there on the highway I just I just love it God said well you can just stay home a little while you can just stay home a little while give you a little more chance to think about me make sure I'm first in your life. You know, we can even look at our, our government. We've tr we've so many people put so much trust. Let me tell you, friends, it don't matter who your president is, who your senator is. At the end of the day, they're just flawed human beings. Hopefully, they're doing the best they can. Some of them I have major doubts about. But there are men and women up there that are trying, but they're flawed. They're still just like us. They're, they're no better or no worse than us. They just have been given a position, hopefully to use for the good of mankind. But friends, we have placed way too much faith and trust in our government. It's time to put faith and trust back in Jesus. Even our very churches. I'm saddened that our churches are closed. I am. I, I, I want to see my church family. I like going to church. I like being with my church family. I like worshiping the Lord with other people. But friends, at the end of the day, we are at a place right now where it's not about going to a fancy building. It's not about going through religious, you know, uh, rituals. It's not about songs and lights and smoke machines and all that stuff might be used a good at times. But it's not about the religious rituals that we go through. It's not about being a member of a church. It's not about being a, a, a going through some kind of ritual to be a member. It's not about all these things. Friends, everything has been stripped away. 
all the way down to do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus for yourself? You can't go through somebody else. You can't have somebody say a prayer for you. You can't, you know, just have somebody else give you a, a cracker or, or a juice and say everything's going to be all right, my son. You know, even the Vatican and all these, everything, all religion is shut down. But let me tell you something, friend. Jesus ain't shut down. Jesus is just as real today, me standing in this old building all by myself today and talking to you through that little box right there. Jesus is just as real. His message is just as real. His word is just as powerful. He is just as real, friend. We can know him for ourselves. He is God this morning. All of these other things were sad imitations, but friends, this morning, he is wanting more than ever to reveal himself to each and every one of us as the one, the true God. And friends, let me tell you, he is on the way back. He said, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. He said, for if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. Friends, I'm afraid sometimes that as Americans, we feel like we are just exempt from the judgments of God. We have lived between these two mighty oceans for so long and enjoyed so many blessings and so much goodness and so much freedom and all of these things that I think we feel like we are somehow insulated from the judgment of God. But friends, our country has strayed so far from the truth of God. Thank God there's still Christian people here still praying, still living for the Lord. God still has his people. But as a nation, friends, we have turned from our God. It's hard to say that we are a Christian nation anymore. We are a, a nation who has some Christians in it. But as a nation, in so many levels, we have turned from him. But friends, he says here, he said, if, these, if they refuse to listen to Moses, look what happened to them. He said, we will not escape if we choose to, re choose to reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. And friends, God is speaking to America from heaven. God is speaking to the nations of the world from heaven. God is speaking to Americans today and he is saying don't think that you're somehow exempt from the judgments of God just because you live in an American nation, just because you check Christian on some form that you fill out. Friends, it is time for us to hear the voice of God for ourselves. For ourselves. To know that we have known the true and living God, that we have submitted our lives to him for ourselves this morning. Because friends, let me tell you, he is the only hope in all of this. It says, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of my creation will be shaken and removed so that only the unshakable things will remain. Friends, we are seeing a shaking. We are seeing a shaking. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. Everything that we might have placed our faith in is the path is being showed to be flawed and useless. We are, everything that can be shaken is being shaken. And friend, the only thing that's not shaken is Jesus. The only not thing that's not shaken is true faith in the true God. He said everything's going to be shaken except the things that can't be shaken. Friends, the word of God can't be shaken. Friends, Jesus can't be shaken. Friends, the power of God can't be shaken this morning. There is one thing that we can put all trust in and know that it will survive. It will win. It cannot be shaken. And that is Jesus, friends. He is the answer. And he wants us to hear him this morning. And notice what it says finally in verse 28. He says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. And he says, because of this, let us be thankful and please God. Friends, it's time for us to hear his voice, to remind ourselves of who he is and who we are supposed to be. It's time for us to fall back down on our knees and thank him for his mercy and for his grace to our nation and for us. To be reminded of where our hope lies. To be reminded of what is truly important in this life. He said, let us be thankful. And then he says, more than just a feeling of gratitude, let us have actions that portray that attitude. He said, let us be thankful and please God. Friend, let us be thankful and please God. How do we please God? 
we obey God. We obey what his word says. If we have sin in our life, we repent of that sin. If we know things to be sin in our life, we repent of those things. We turn and we walk away from those things. We trust God to keep us victorious over these things. When we fall down, we call back out to him and we turn around and we repent and we stay in the fold, in the faith. We live lives that are pleasing unto God. I know we are all flawed and we are all feeble and we all make mistakes. But friend, we don't have to live a life of sin. If we know something is sin, the Bible says turn from that sin. Repent of that sin. Receive forgiveness of our sins. Friends, Jesus is calling out. He says, hear me this morning. Be thankful for me. Please God by worshiping him. And finally he ends with this. With holy fear and awe. Holy fear and awe. Friends, if you know Jesus, you don't have to fear him. But we have to respect him. The fear he is talking about, we need to know, friends, God is a merciful God. God is a good God. He is a gracious God. Oh, he's a patient God. He's been so patient with me. But, friends, don't ever get to the place where we think that God is to be taken, not to be taken seriously. Let me tell you, friend, God, the Bible says, don't fear him who can take your, take your life. He said, fear him and take your soul and cast it into a devil's hell. Friend, we should have a, an awestruck, revere, and reverence for the Almighty God. See, one day His grace is going to be turned to judgment. One day He is going to say, that's enough. He said in one place that I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Friend, everything God does, He does that in hopes that we will repent. Even when things come upon us like we are facing right now, in the midst of this, this is not God saying, I hate you and I'm going to punish you. This is God saying, this is the result of sin. This is my call to you saying, repent, turn from your ways before it is too late. He always holds out the hand of mercy in the midst of every struggle and every tragedy. And he is calling out to us this morning, come back to me. Repent of your sins. Remind yourself of what's truly important in this life. Come to me in a holy reverence and a fear and stand in awe of what I'm going to do. Friends, when we see the things that are happening, all of the events in the world that are literally, it's, it's like reading revelations come to life right before our eyes. When we, when we see these things, it not only should it stir us up and, and get us, make us, you know, remind us of what's going to happen, but we should stand in awe and say, what a mighty God we serve. These things that were written hundreds of years ago, let me tell you, friends, they are going to come to pass down to the very last, the Bible says, jot and tittle, down to the last little period of the word. It's going to happen exactly like Jesus said it was going to happen, exactly to the very letter. We should stand in awe and say, oh, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. He is on the way. He is bringing about his plan and his purpose. All of the world could fight against it, and they can't stop one single part of his plan from coming to pass. Friends, we serve an awesome God this morning. We serve an awesome God. So what do we do this morning? We hear him. We hear him. Hear his voice calling to us in these things that we see all around us, friend. These are like God sending little warning shots saying, hey, Get ready. Get ready. These are, this is God trying to open our eyes and help us to see that time is running out, friend. We are to hear him. Then we are to call to him and surrender our lives wholly and totally to him, placing our trust totally in him, knowing that he has us in the palm of his hand. And then we are to live for Jesus, not for ourselves. Then we are to tell others about this Jesus, and we are to watch. The Bible says, watch and pray. Watch and and pray, friends. I'm going to let you go with this. I read a little thing somebody wrote on, I don't know if it's Facebook, Instagram, I'm not sure, but somebody wrote this. They said, I can't wait until we can get back to living the way we were. I understand the sentiment of what they were probably saying. There are things about the life that we had two weeks ago that many of us are anxious to get back to. Good things, things that aren't wrong. We want to get back to some normalcy. We want to get back to our friends and our families and, and all, all of these things that aren't, in and of themselves aren't wrong. But when I thought of that, I, I just thought, oh, I, 
think maybe some of the way we've been living is what brought us where we are right now anyway. Notice he said, I can't wait to get back to living the way we were. Friends, when this is over, when we get through this, even if we get through this and life seems to kind of turn back to a, a life of normalcy again, don't think that it's over. Don't think we can just go back the way we were. Friends, Jesus is coming. There'll be something else. There's other things that are coming our way. Let us not go back to living the way that we were. Let us go back to living the way that we should be in anticipation of the coming of Jesus. Living our lives in a way that are pleasing to our Lord, our Savior. Living our lives for Him, not for ourselves. Friends, I don't want to go back to living the way that I was. I want to go back to living the way that I should be. I want to have a newfound fervor and passion knowing that time is short and Jesus is coming. It's time to get ready, friends. It's time to get ready. If you're not, if you're not saved this morning, friends, I pray that you're hearing his voice today. I pray that you're hearing him calling out to you through this message. I pray that you are, are feeling something stirring inside of you. See, friends, that's a good thing. That's a good thing if you're, you're feeling that nervousness and you're starting to think about these eternal things and, and, and you just feel like you know that God is speaking to you. That's a good thing. He hadn't forgot about you. See, friend, the Bible says we come to the Lord because he draws us to him. We don't just decide one day, well, I think I'll get it right with God so I can go to heaven and all. No, friends, God gives us an opportunity. And friends, when he, when he deals with our heart, that's your moment. That's your time. I don't know if you'll have another time. I don't know if you'll have another opportunity, but I know this, right now, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to be sure you're right with God. You have an opportunity right now, if he is dealing with your heart, to say, yes, Lord, I choose you. Lord, I choose you over all the false, false gods of this world. Jesus Christ, I believe you are the Savior of the world. I believe you died upon that cross for my sin. I believe you died, but I believe on that third day you rose again. And I believe you have ascended into heaven. You are seated at the right hand of God. And there's going to come a day when you're going to come back to this earth. And when you do, you step out on those clouds and call your people home to be with you in the rapture of the church. I want you to call my name. I'm placing my faith in you today, Jesus. Friends, wherever you're at, if you'll get out on your knees right now if you can, Wherever you're at, if you'll in faith, ask Jesus to save your heart. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Ask him to come in to your soul and live within your heart today. Repent of your sins. Turn from those sins. Determine in your heart and life to live for Jesus. Friends, if you'll get serious with him, he'll get serious with you. Call unto him, and friends, you'll find him this morning. God bless you this morning. I love you. And I appreciate you. Jesus is coming this morning. Hear his voice. God bless.